I'll record this particular session so it'll be uploaded on the nts.org.nz website under resources along with the other, um, the other video. Okay, so let's get started. So I've done that. Uh, use the chat function. Um, if, you've, if you want to ask questions, that's the easiest way to go about doing that. Um, now, I think with all of these, um, all the discussions on e-cigarettes tend to be a little bit heated sometimes, and I think probably influenced by people's views. So I'm highlighting my view at the bottom on, uh, on vaporizers and electronic cigarettes, and uh, to say that I think they can make an overall positive contribution uh, to public health, especially if we're talking about smokers who are switching to vaporizers and stop smoking altogether. In terms of my views and practice, um, this is what I believe. Uh, the best thing smokers can do to improve their health is to quit smoking. And so when I'm working in our stop smoking service at Counties Monaco, I discuss what I can offer to help people quit. For those smokers who can't or won't quit, um, or perhaps have tried absolutely everything, then the next best thing would be to switch to vaping. And I provide information to my clients about what we currently know about vaping. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, to try and give you a little bit of knowledge um, so you can pass this on to your clients. Um, for those who choose to switch from vaping, uh, from smoking to vaping, I support them, as I would with any client in a stop smoking attempt. <clears throat> okay, so let's start from the very beginning. And I'm going to try throughout this presentation to use the term vaporizer as opposed to electronic cigarette. I think um, you know, we're, perhaps we never really gave the right name to e uh, to vaporizers and we called them e-cigarettes. And people do get a little bit confused. And perhaps even the name um, cigarette makes it sound like it might be a tobacco product. And of course, these aren't tobacco products, they're vaporized nicotine delivery systems. And when we talk about vaporizer, there's one, not one particular product. They're all, they're all different, uh, different shapes, different sizes, different um, differences in their ability to deliver vapor and indeed nicotine. Um, actually, when I was talking to my clients, um, one of my clients last week, and I asked her if she'd used a, a, an electronic cigarette, and she'd said no. And then further in the conversation, she said she'd used a vaporizer. When I asked her a little bit more closely what she meant, she referred to these tank-based systems here as vaporizers, and she referred to these um, cigar-like devices as electronic cigarettes. So even the terminology out there is somewhat mixed, mixed. So you may need to just explore a little bit about what people mean by vaporizer or electronic cigarette. Now, in terms of their components, they have all of them, regardless of their shape, size, type, all have three main components. One, they need a battery. So you can see this here, here, and these batteries, of course, differ in size. Typically, the bigger the battery, the more power, and the more power means more vapors produced, uh, and in some situations, more nicotine also delivered. These ones are all the tank systems. So you can see here uh, the, the, the tank for putting in the liquid that gets vaporized. You can see the heating element in here. Some, some elements have wicks. You can see this one here has this cotton wick, and that draws the liquid up into the heating element. Others have the heating element at the base, so the liquid doesn't have to travel up wicks to start with. This can make a bit of a difference when people are using them. You can imagine if you've got a wick, then you need to give it some time for the liquid to, be, to soak through it and get up to the heating element. Mouthpieces all differ as well. Um, from these, I, I guess these are more traditional ones to ones that are really just a just the top of the uh, top part of the tank. Oh, just a point actually on before I move on on cleaning these things. Uh, clients do need to clean them. They do get mucky after a while, um, and some of my clients report they clean them every every day or every other day, and they just get a bit of tissue unscrew the, the tank and wipe out the tank um, of the, the liquid. 
The atomizers or the heating elements also need replacing from time to time. Um, they don't last forever. And once the heating element uh, gets a bit old, it doesn't vaporize or heat the, the liquid uh, as well as it should do. And people might notice this as it's just not doing the same thing it was at the beginning. So these things, the atomizers or heating elements aren't expensive, but they do need to be, do need to be changed. So uh, just keep that in mind. Now, in terms of the liquid that you use, um, look, people use very different uh, ranges of flavors, strengths of nicotine, and even the ratio of vegetable glycerin, that's VG, to propylene glycol. Now, typically, these liquids have a mix of both, um, and these are at different ratios. Uh, the propylene glycol element sort of gives you that throat hit. Um, the vegetable glycerin is a bit sweeter, it's smoother, and this is what people might be using more of if they're doing the sort of the cloud chasing stuff, so producing lots of, uh, lots of vaping cloud. They're significantly less expensive than cigarettes, of course. So I just did a search online and a 30 ml bottle, which would certainly last a week for most people, is only $25. So uh, you can see here, one of the advantages of switching is, is finance. In terms of nicotine concentration, um, I guess most people would start perhaps on a 12 milligram per mil, but you'll see lots of people that are on much lower strengths also. I think people don't like the hit or the stretchiness of nicotine. This is very similar to nicotine chewing gum or lozenges or mouth spray. And so by using a lower strength, they seem to be able to tolerate that a bit more. But of course, the downside to this is if people smoke for the nicotine. So if they've got a really low nicotine strength, then they might have to vape more often, or um, they might have a better device which can vaporize the nicotine more efficiently. And we don't have good data here yet in New Zealand on um, vaping. Uh, it, we are, it is improving. Um, but I'm just going to show you some data here from the UK. I'm showing you here from the UK because e-cigarettes or vaporizers have been around um, for a good 10 years now and the data is collected routinely in the UK and the UK regulation is very similar to how we'll move to or propose to move to next year. Now there are two lines on here, one is ever tried, that's the blue line, and the other line is current use. So you can see here um, over half of adult smokers in the UK have tried vaping. Now try might be even just one puff, um, but most don't go on to use these regularly. Now it does take practice to use these things. Um, they're not like smoking. They're nowhere near, near enjoyable as smoking. And so you have to persist with them. It's a little bit like nicotine replacement therapy really, um, that once people get used to it, then they actually go on to like it. So there's a little bit of practice involved here. And over time, you can see here that around 20%, around one in the five um, smokers are currently using vaporizers or electronic cigarettes. It has flattened off though in the latter years, so it's not continuing to, to rise. In terms of reasons for vaping, um, here you can see the uh, vaping and current smokers and the blue bars of vaping and ex-smokers. So among, among ex-smokers, the most common reason given is this one down here, to help me stop completely. And that's what you'd expect in those that have already stopped. Around, among those that are still smoking and vaping, this is this dual use, the most common reason given is to help me reduce the amount I smoke, but not stop completely. Okay, so you see this, this difference. Um, look, the, very simply, to really get the health benefits, you need to stop smoking completely. That is the best way to go. So I'd always encourage people that are vaping to aim to stop smoking completely, because that's where you'll get your, your biggest health benefits, not from this dual use. Now you'll hear a lot of, con a lot of concerns raised, and these are all valid concerns. Um, and I want to just explore each of these on their own. So some of them are, concerning a gateway to smoking. So will young people who never smoke start vaping 
and that will lead them on to smoking. So that's the gateway effect. There's also debate about that there's no proof that vaporizers help people quit smoking, that they're highly addictive, and that they contain a range of toxic substances. So I'm going to address all of these things as we go through. So first of all, are they a gateway? That is, what's the uptake in children and non-smokers, and do they go on to smoke tobacco? Now, this was something I um, just wanted to highlight. I pulled it on, off online. Um, it was titled Tobacco Use, and uh, already they're saying increase in e-cigarette use by high school students from uh, 2011 to 2015, 900%. And then on the other side of this little poster is 11 to 17 year olds who think that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking. 70% thought that. Now, first of all, vaping is not tobacco use. These are not tobacco products. Yes, they contain nicotine, which is often uh, produced from tobacco, but these are not tobacco products, nor are they cigarettes. You do not burn, there is no combustion. So already we're reducing harm. And yes, we did see this increase in high school students trying e-cigarettes between 2011 and 2015. These are US data, by the way. Um, but this was ever use. This is experimentation. So young people do try stuff. The important question to ask is, do they go on to vape regularly? And well, when I looked at the statement on the right-hand side that 11 to 17 year olds who think that e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking, well I say smart kids, because e-cigarettes are less harmful than smoking. So let's take a look at smoking versus vaping in young people. Now these data were published recently, they all come from the UK, uh, and it combines data from five different youth surveys. So overall, there are around 60,000 young people in this particular survey. So the different colored bars represent the different surveys. So if you look at ever smoked, um, the red bar here is uh, the Salsa survey from Scotland and 15 year olds. Um, so you can see 31% of 15 year olds in Scotland in this survey had reported ever smoking. It's very similar to those that report ever vaping. Okay, so this is just ever use, ever taken a puff on a cigarette or a puff on a vaporizer. When you look at regular smoking, you can see the numbers there are significantly lower. Okay, um, we're doing pretty well in New Zealand on, on this in this regard um, too. When you look at regular vaping, it's lower than the smoke regular smoking. Okay, so that's that here. But this is all. This is all people, both. Um, non-smokers and smokers on the regular vaping. So I'm going to show you here vaping by smoking status, okay? So first, let's look at ever use, ever use of a vaporizer, okay? So if you look at the, if you take regular smokers and look at how many have ever used a vaporizer, you can see quite large numbers of regular smokers have tried vaping. And when you take regular smokers who use vaping, you know, on a more regular basis, in this case weekly, you can see somewhere around 25 to 30% or so that are also vaping regularly. Now look at the never smokers use. So first of all, never smokers, so young people that have never smoked, that have ever tried vaping, even a, even a puff. You can see there this ranges from 4 to 14%. So what I'm saying here is that most of the trying is happening in those that smoke in terms of uh, proportions. But if you look at never smokers weekly use, so these are never smokers who vape regularly, less than half a percent. So it is, it is occurring, but in a very small way. Okay, so most regular use of vaping occurs in people that are already smoking, not in those who don't smoke. Now, what about in, in adults? Um, so this is looking at never and long-term ex-smokers. Okay, the 
the dotted lines here are ex-smokers and the solid, solid lines are never smokers. So these data are from the UK again. And what you're seeing here in this pale green line here is e-cigarette or vaporizing use in long-term ex-smokers. Okay, so a lot of these are smokers that have quit and switched to vaping. So just under 10%. This is looking at long-term ex-smokers using nicotine replacement therapy. Okay, so you can see around about 3% of long-term ex-smokers are also using another alternative nicotine delivery system. Now look at the never smokers here. The green line is never smokers that use NRT. There's a really tiny percentage of never smokers that use NRT. And similarly, a very small percentage of never smokers that use electronic cigarettes or vaporizers in this blue line. So the, the story here is that vaping products are predominantly used by either current or ex-smokers. There are small numbers of never smokers that use these nicotine devices, but the proportion is very low. Now, the question then is, is vaping a gateway to smoking, I should say, if the things disappeared off the end. Now, this was a meta-analysis published this year in JAMA Pediatrics. And this took um, a, a range of different studies shown here, which looked at a population of never smokers at the beginning, who had either tried e-cigarettes or not, and then followed them up to see whether they later tried smoking. And what they found is that young people that tried vaping were more likely to go on to try smoking than people that had never tried vaping at baseline. Okay, so this shows that there is, a, there is an association between trying vaporizers or trying, to va trying vaping and trying smoking. Okay, so there is that association. Does it confirm gateway hypothesis? I'm afraid it doesn't. So there are a whole lot of other factors that we'd need to consider. So bottom line here is that the data are showing an association between smoking and uh, vaping and smoking, but not a causative pathway. It might be just that those young people that try vaping are also the ones that are more likely to try smoking as well. And those that don't try smoking are also the ones that don't try vaping. So it's very difficult to tease apart. So bottom line here, there's no evidence to support gateway theory, but equally there's no evidence to refute it at the moment either. And a couple of more recent longitudinal studies from the UK uh, that weren't including in, included in this meta-analysis also show, show the same thing. And here you can see in this study, the authors say, while acknowledging that a causal relationship may be plausible, we cannot confirm this based on our findings. And the trends observed over the same time period in the UK, the rates of e-cigarette use has increased, but the rates of cigarette use have continued to decline. So that is, if there was a, a gateway effect, then you'd also, as, as e-cigarette use went up, smoking prevalence should also follow in theory. Another study here, um, again, acknowledging a possible relationship between e-cigarettes and tobacco experiment experimentation, but it may not be causal. If young never smokers who try an e-cigarette would have gone on to initiate smoking anyway due to being already favorably disposed towards tobacco use. So it's all these other things that we can't always detect in young people. Um, you know, e-cigarette use may just be a marker of tobacco use. Okay, another concern, might vaping undermine quitting? And part of this was um, perhaps some of the early advertising. So here's an example here of why quit switch to blue. So blue being a, a brand of, uh, of electronic cigarette. Um, so this was, you know, 
this, this sort of advertising might encourage people to do both. They say, oh good, I don't need to quit smoking completely now. I can just vape when I can't smoke and carry on smoking. Now, one of the um, meta-analysis published, uh, this is it here in 2016, actually found that e-cigarette use may undermine quitting. So if you've used e-cigarettes, you may not be able to quit smoking. But they took a whole lot of very different studies here. Um, not all, of course, that are or were designed to test whether e-cigarettes help people stop smoking. Some of them are just population-based studies. Now, the biggest problem with this meta-analysis is that they removed people that have already been helped by um, e-cigarettes. Okay, so in, in this particular meta-analysis and these studies that they used, they only included smokers who had tried e-cigarettes but hadn't found them helpful. Whereas all the smokers that found e-cigarettes helpful had now stopped smoking, so weren't included in the sample. Okay, so this is just a methodological flaw in this particular meta-analysis. A better meta-analysis is this one. So this is the Cochrane Review. Now, currently in the Cochrane Review, there are only two randomized controlled trials to include. One was done here in New Zealand by Chris Bullen and colleagues. The other one's an Italian study. And both of these studies randomized people to get a nicotine-containing vaporizer or a non-nicotine or placebo vaporizer. Okay, so roughly 50-50 uh, split here. What you find when you combine the data from both of these studies is that those smokers that used a nicotine-containing vaporizer were significantly more likely to quit smoking than those that used a placebo one. You can see here low quit rates long-term, 9% versus 4%, but a rough doubling of these quit rates. So there are data to show that nicotine-containing vaporizers can help people quit smoking. They're certainly not a magic cure based on these data here but they can help. So far, we've only got one study that compared the nicotine vaporizer with nicotine patch, and there's no significant difference between these. Now, it's a bit hard based on the numbers in this one study to, to confirm um, much more, but given that e-cigarettes can deliver nicotine in a similar way to the NRT, you'd perhaps expect them to be equally as effective. And we also have other data, um, which is are not from randomized controlled trials. Now, this is, um, these are population data okay, from the US. And what you're seeing here is the percentage of smokers who quit for at least three months over, over the years. And you can see here, it's been pretty stable from 2001, 3, 6, and right up to 10 and 11. Okay, so no significant difference there in population quit rates just over 4%. Then something changes here in 2014 and 15. You can see the significant jump in population quit rates. More people are quitting. And this was the sort of time that e-cigarettes were more likely to be used by smokers. Okay, so it was suggestive that actually e-cigarettes may have been responsible for boosting these population quit rates. So when you look at smokers who didn't use an e-cigarette versus those that did. Look at the big difference here in quit rates. So the conclusions from this particular trial is that, well, actually vaping appears to have increased smoking cessation at a population level. Now, you have to be a bit cautious with these studies because there may have been other things that were going on at the same time. Ah, um, question from someone, at what point were the outcome measured um, in this one year? So in this study, I guess you're uh, talking about. So this was smoking cessation rates were um, obtained from those that reported smoking in 12 months before the survey. And then it was about whether they've stopped smoking for at least three months. So it's just a, a sort of three month point prevalence here. So 
there are data to show that e-cigarettes can help people stop smoking. I don't think the magic cures at the moment, uh, and some effort is, is needed. Now, another concern is that nicotine's highly addictive, and will we get people hooked on nicotine that would not have otherwise done so? Well, um, nicotine is addictive, um, especially when it's delivered in cigarette smoke. And I think that's the key message here. When it's in tobacco smoke, it's highly addictive you know that you can get nicotine replacement therapy on the counter at the supermarket, for example. How many never smokers do you know that have got hooked on using nicotine chewing gum? Nicotine gum can give you good blood levels of, of nicotine, but it's not as enjoyable or as rewarding as you get from smoking. So the bottom line here is it's not all about the nicotine. We know that because very few never smokers who try e-cigarettes become regular users. If they were really addictive, then just trying it for a few days perhaps would lead to more people vaping regularly. Also, vapor, vapors report that they use um, or feel less dependent on vaporizers than they did on cigarettes. And there are some possible reasons for this. One, the absorption from your lungs is still not as good as smoking. So it it's, it's, can be better than nicotine replacement therapy. Um, in terms of nicotine delivery, but it's still typically slower than smoking. And remember, the addictiveness of cigarettes is likely to be related to other substances in tobacco smoke as well as the nicotine. So nicotine, it's not just about the nicotine. Um, there are other substances that may potentiate the addictiveness of nicotine in cigarette smoke. Now, all this might change, of course, as the technology continues to evolve, but at the moment, um, e-cigarettes are not as addictive as smoking. Now, what about nicotine delivery then? Well, the amount of nicotine delivered to the user depends on a number of different factors. It depends on the concentration of nicotine in the liquid that they're using. Typically, the higher the concentration of, in the liquid, the more nicotine that they'll receive. It also depends on other constituents in the liquid. For example, a higher amount of propylene glycol or higher ratio of propylene glycol to vegetable glycerin may improve nicotine delivery. The heating of the liquid is also important in how it's vaporized and the technique of the user. So this is not like a medicine where you just take it and you get a standard dose. There are lots of different factors to consider. When you look at nicotine delivery, um, these are some um, data from our lab in London and what we did here is we took 12 vapors, 12 experienced vapors, um, who were still smoking every now and then. And we got them to smoke after not vaping or smoking overnight, got them to smoke their usual brand cigarettes. So this is the blood nicotine levels here after smoking one of their usual brand cigarettes. So you can see it peaking here around 18 nanograms per mil. Then we got them to try a number of different vaporizers. The next best one was this Views device, which is this one here. Now this one has a high concentration of nicotine, 48 milligrams per mil. Okay, so high, high nicotine delivery, which is why you might see this peak here. The next best was the Inokin device. Okay, this tank system here and the gray line. But everything else, mostly averaged around about eight nanograms per mil. Now this is very similar to the amount that you can get from four milligram nicotine chewing gum. Okay. But what you might notice, and you'll remember that the peak plasma concentration from four milligram gum is somewhere around here at 20 minutes. Whereas you're seeing the peak plasma concentration here within 10 minutes. So these vaporing devices don't deliver as much nicotine as smoking, but certainly deliver it faster than our current nicotine replacement products. All of these will be available online um, at the end of the presentation. Now what about safety? Because if you're like me, your clients are gonna say, how safe are these things? 
Well, let's first talk about some of the concerns around nicotine. Uh, as you know, because you use nicotine replacement therapy in pregnant women who smoke, there are some adverse effects of nicotine in pregnancy. There's also data from animal studies that suggest that it might have adverse effects on adolescent brain development. Nicotine's addictive, and in very high doses, it's toxic. Okay, so um, in, you have to get high doses. It's somewhere between six and 12 or so milligrams per kilogram. Okay, it's not just about giving a single dose. It depends on the size of the person you're giving it to as well. So that's why nicotine, smaller doses of nicotine are more toxic in kids than they are in adults. Okay, so it's not to say that nicotine is um, completely harmless for everyone, but when we're using it in people who smoke, it really doesn't have many health consequences, if any, at all. Okay, that's why some people would say it's about as harmful as caffeine is when we're talking about uh, it in smokers. Now, what about other toxins or toxicants in vapour? Well, some have been found, and these include uh, carcinogens like acrolin, um, acetaldehyde, also um, metals and silicate particles. These come <laughs> from the components of the e-cigarettes, uh, and these have been found in vapour. But where they have been found, they've typically been at quite low levels, okay, or at levels where they're unlikely to cause harm. This exception of formaldehyde, um, high levels of this can be generated when you operate vaporizers at really high temperatures. Now this doesn't happen in real life because when users do this, they get a really unpleasant taste. It's known as a dry puff. And so they just don't do it. Okay, but in, in theory, you can overheat your vaporizer um, and, and cook your e-liquid and you'll generate more toxicants. It's a bit like burning your toast. In the morning, you could keep pushing down the lever and you'd get black toast and you could eat it and that would expose you to more toxicants than just your normal colored toast in the morning. But burnt toast isn't that pleasant to eat. And so we typically, of course, don't do that. So in terms of toxicants, and this is about uh, you know, how you phrase your advice to people, given that there's very little uptake of regular vaping and never smoking, the exposure and health risks with vaping should be compared with smoking, not with breathing fresh air, okay? We're, because we're not talking about that. We're talking about people who smoke. We know the risks of smoking. We know they're large. There's really nothing as dangerous as smoking. Therefore, vaping is going to be a risk reduction because although these toxicants have been found in vaping, uh, in vapor, that are much lower levels than cigarette smoke. Okay, so it's a risk reduction. Now, just to give you an example here of cancer risk, and I just want to uh, bring your draw your eyes down to the bottom of the table here. This is the this is the cancer risk associated with tobacco smoke. So this is the comparator here. Okay, it's it's one. Now here is the concentrate, uh, here's the cancer risk associated with heat not burn products. Now these are new, we don't have them on the New Zealand market, okay, um, but just just so you know, though even those look like they're uh, significantly less risky in terms of cancer risk than smoking. Here you have e-cigarettes, you can see here it's just a small fraction of the cancer risk of smoking and here is the nicotine inhalator, the NRT product, which is, again, even lower. Okay, so really much lower risks. If you take the nicotine inhalator as the comparison here, and we know that those don't give people cancer, um, then yes, there's a, a small increase in e-cigarettes, a bit more for these heat not burn products, but this is smoking. There is nothing as dangerous as smoking. So switching people from smoking to vaporizers is a risk reduction and quite a large risk reduction. Now the problem is we can't exactly be certain of um, the level of risk, but we can make an estimate based on the facts that we know. We know what's in cigarette smoke, um, and we know that most of the toxins in cigarette smoke are either absent in e-cigarette vapor or at levels that are much lower, some sort of 5% of the doses from smoking. 
which is why Public Health England a few years ago came out with saying that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than smoking. But they might be 99% safer than smoking. We, we don't exactly know and we won't know until we have more data available to us. So hopefully you agree with me that e-cigarettes are safer than smoking. Now, what you're looking at here is uh, or a data from adults in the UK or Great Britain over time, and they're asked their perception of harm from vaping relative to smoking. Okay, now this blue bar here are those people that say that vaporizers are more or equally as harmful as smoking. So more harmful than smoking or at least as harmful than smoking. So in 2013, we only had 7% that thought this. But look, it started to go the wrong way. So by 2017, this year, a quarter of all people think that vaping is equally or more harmful than smoking. Now something's gone terribly wrong here because this is not the case. And I don't think you'd get anyone that would agree that this is the case. So we've got some, uh, some wildly inaccurate beliefs out there to correct. Now, New Zealand currently, the sale and supply of nicotine-containing vaporizers is unlawful, okay? But only if they contain nicotine. You can sell non-nicotine-containing e-liquids and vaporizers to anyone, unless it looks like a cigarette and then you can't sell it to under 18-year-olds. But in the, the current situation, um, if you had something that didn't look like a cigarette product, um, you could sell it to a 12-year-old, as long as it didn't contain nicotine, which is kind of crazy. Okay. But people can obtain nicotine-containing vaping products for their own personal use uh, via online sales um, via overseas. Now, this year, the government committed to changing the legislation. So in 2018, it would be legal to sell um, nicotine containing vaporizers with some controls though. So the controls that are going to be put in place are that you would not be able to sell or supply in a public place to under 18 year olds regardless of nicotine content. So nicotine free or nicotine containing e-cigarettes could not be sold to under 18 year olds. There would be prohibi prohibition of broader advertising so there would be no billboard advertising of vaping products, for example. You won't be able to vape in places where you can't smoke under the Smoke Free Environments Act. There'll be some requirements for product safety and there'll be a regulatory framework developed to make sure that the devices that we do have are as safe as we can possibly get them. In terms of some advertising, the current uh, proposal is to allow some point of sale displays. That is where you go to buy your vaping products, you'll be able to see what they look like as opposed to being behind closed doors like cigarettes are. And if you're in an R18 retail environment, then you'll be able to promote the vaping products a little bit more widely within that store. So they're the proposed changes. Now, if you're, if you're like me, you will get questions about uh, vaping. You know, people say, so what about this vaping? Is it safe? Will it help me quit? I think you need to be comfortable in addressing these things. One, in terms of safety, you can't say that these things are 100% safe, but you can confidently say they are safer than smoking. We don't know the long-term risks of vaping. I'm sure that there will be some, but these would be less than if this person had otherwise carried on smoking for many years. Will it help me quit? Well, it delivers nicotine. They're using a nicotine vaporizer that delivers nicotine. There's no reason why it wouldn't help them quit smoking. But they're no magic cure. And it does involve a little bit of effort and work and persistence, I think, in getting the most out of vaping products. Now, I can't provide vaping products in my, in my practice. Um, and I usually encourage people to go off and do their own research, looking at some of the uh, local websites. Um, or even going to visit their vaping store. But I do tell them um, what I know, 
I also ask them when they come back and I ask them questions about what, uh, what liquid they're using, what flavor, what strength, because this is all helps, it's helpful for me in learning more about these products. And if you want to have a, a look at a very good um, video, this is um, produced by the National Center for Smoking Cessation and Training in the UK. Uh, they've got a number of uh, short videos. Um, it's called The Switch. So it's looking at why people should switch from smoking to vaping. Um, this one explains e-cigarette safety and some of the facts. So it's definitely worth a listen to. It's only 13 minutes. Um, and we'll put a link to this on our website as well. So if you need to find it, you can find it relatively quickly. So before we take any questions, um, just to conclude, there's growing evidence. We're not quite there yet, but there's growing evidence that e-cigarettes do help people stop smoking. I don't think it's helpful to say they, they don't or there's not enough evidence so we can't talk about it. Remember going back to the basics, these things deliver nicotine, just like nicotine replacement therapy, but a little faster, um, and so that might be more helpful. The long-term health effects, especially of long-term vaping, remain unknown, but any health risks that do emerge are likely to be many times than the risks associated with smoking. So this is a harm reduction approach. I think when we're talking about regulation, the risks need to be proportional. There is still nothing as harmful as smoking. Um, and yes, ultimately, we'd love people to stop smoking completely and not use any nicotine, but that for many people is not going to be a short-term goal. And so we've got to be comfortable, I think, with some people using nicotine longer term. We see that already with nicotine replacement therapy. And I think the current evidence shows that allowing smokers to better access to vaping is associated with net public health benefit. There are some good modeling studies out there that show even with the potential risks of gateway, that overall that you're going to get uh, overall net public health benefit. That's not to say, of course, that we shouldn't conduct ongoing monitoring. These are new, we need to keep an eye on these things um, and we'll see how these things go. Okay, so that's it from me. I'll unmute you all and happy to take any questions. And if you'd rather just type your question, then do that. Hayden, could you talk a little bit more about the PGVG ratios? Yeah, so the PGVG ratio, that's the ratio of propylene glycol to vegetable glycerin, is, is really a little bit about our personal preference. The more vegetable glycerin you have, the smoother it is. It's also a little bit sweeter, so some of my um, vaping clients tell me. And with more vegetable glycerin, you get more vapor produced. The propylene glycol is sort of the, it's the drier, it makes people's mouths a little bit dry. It also gives you that hit at the back of the throat. And so altering those ratios can alter the experience. I was, I'm not an expert in, in adjusting the ratios, but uh, the people in the vape stores certainly can help them. I've got one vape store that seems to be sort of a bit different to the others in that they've got all low strength, you know, three, three, six percent, and I was saying that they have high VG mixes because they're smoother, yeah. and that their devices are better, so people are getting a bigger cloud, yeah. and if they're getting a bigger cloud and it's smooth, they're still getting the same amounts of nicotine because they are... Well, not just that they're vaping more frequently, but there's more vapour going into their lungs. Yeah. And that, um, that's certainly possible. Um, and this is where, you know, different devices uh, vaporise in different ways. Um, as you might know, in the UK, there's a limit on the maximum concentration of nuclear um, There's a maximum concentration of nicotine allowed in the UK uh, and that's 20 milligrams per mil. And so, you know, to get around that, there have been improvements in devices that are more efficient at delivering nicotine. And again, the, 
the mix of propylene glycol versus vegetable glycerin may also help there. I think there's still a few questions around all of this. Um, we've uh, showed in some research we've done in the UK that actually reducing the nicotine concentration in e-liquid, if you've been used to a higher amount, you do get compensatory vaping as well, just like you do if you cut down on your cigarettes. Any other questions for me? Has there been any more research specifically around COPD? Uh, you know, people with COPD using vaping. Um, Riccardo Peloza's team in Italy um, have continued to do some work in people with respiratory illness. Um, and you know, some of those data show that some respiratory symptoms improve when people stop smoking and switch to vaping. And I think this is primarily because they're stopping smoking uh, is the, the, the main benefit there. Um, I, th I think when you're dealing with people with respiratory illness, it's smoking that's causing the major harm. And yep, ideally, wouldn't it be great if everyone um, could stop smoking and perhaps not continue to vape? But that's not the reality for many people. And for many people with COPD, um, they're very highly dependent and have tried absolutely anything, er everything available. Um, and vaping may be an option to get them off smoking, which would be the first, uh, the, the first step that would be, that's really important. I've got a number of clients with CO, COPD who, you know, desperate, seem to be mainly women, like anxious, nervy women. And um, but we're getting into a pattern of uh, they might be quit for some time and then they'll have a few smokes. Um, then they'll get, get back into the vaping again. Overall, they're using a lot less tobacco, but they're really struggling to maintain complete abstinence you know, month in, month out. And initially, they all seem to have an improvement in symptoms, which I think, as you say, is linked to stopping smoking. Um, but then I've got a couple who now seem to have had sort of a, a run of respiratory issues. And I'm just, it's very difficult how to advise those people um, because I do, you know, I do wonder if now this is the effect of the vaping beginning to show um, on their lung health? Um, we, we don't have any evidence at the moment to show that vaping is a significantly detrimental effect on lung health. Um, I think you've got to, you know, if we, we do this, we really need to test properly and we need a control group. Of course, with people with lung disease, um, it's, it's not going to reverse the lung disease. And it's, it's like smoking cessation. Some people feel worse or they still get the exacerbations of their COPD. Uh, what we're really about with smoking cessation is stopping the rapid progression of their illness. Uh, and that's, that's the main point. Any other questions? I'm not sure if this is your area, but um, what recovery? Joanne, I can't hear you very well, I'm afraid. Oh. Can you, can you maybe type your question? Okay. Okay, so the question from Joanne is, um, how much healing can smokers get after quitting? Um, that really depends on, on what sort of uh, illness you're, you're talking about. In, in general, the risks associated with smoking decrease over, over time. But uh, in terms of lung, 
lung damage that's already done, you typically don't get any any healing. Um, it just stops the more rapid progression that's associated with, with smoking. Um, but there are other benefits, of course. So stopping smoking, you remove the carbon monoxide. Um, if you're removing the carbon monoxide, especially if, if you've already got underlying lung disease, that's going to increase your oxygen carrying capacity. So there are benefits, no matter what you know, what you're looking at. But um, you know, be be careful not to overstate the um, the healing and the, the health benefits that you get in some illnesses. Uh, and in others, for example, stroke, it takes a very long time to get back to the uh, the risk of someone that doesn't smoke. Questions from anyone? Joanne, are you um, are you typing one more question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I can actually hear you a little bit better now. Um, Oh, is, oh, is it clear from the MOH reporting how many clients access services are using vaporizer only or in conjunction with NRT? Um, it's, Sarah, it's a little bit hard to determine from the reporting, Sarah, exactly what we're doing, looking at with only or with. We can only just see those, the proportion of clients that uh, use a vaporizer. Um, this is something we really need to change in the future. I think if within your own services, you should be able to know that because we can do it for ourselves and we will know whether people are using uh, vaporizer alone or in conjunction with NRT. Um, Joanne uh, says, lungs clean themselves when you quit. What are the benefits? Um, you do get some repair happening, especially in the, the upper airways, um, but you, you're not going to get the lung further down in the, in the sacs repairing themselves. So even just having better defense mechanisms in your upper airways is going to lessen um, your risk of getting uh, upper airways uh, infections. So there are always better ways. Um, examples, Joanne. I'll if you do want to, if you want to give me a call later. Um, I'll put my number up, and you can you can call me to discuss. Okay, if everyone's happy, um, that's all good. Um, just one more from Sarah. Um, any good forums for vapors to join and upskill? Now, there are a number of different fora on, on websites. I'd encourage people to do a little bit of searching. Um, have a look yourself um, and, and see what you can, can find. Okay, with that, thank you very much, everyone. Um, there won't be another webinar um, from me until February. So that will be the first one in February in this Waitangi Day or something like that this year. Um, we'll let you know in advance anyway, and this will be available online shortly. Thanks very much, and have a great day. And good Christmas and Happy New Year. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.